Hey, Karen. Hi, Christy. Why did the Japanese beetle larva molt to an adult? I don't know. Why? It was tired of being grubby. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy, a backyard gardener from Colorado. These days, gardening has gotten very popular, and my friends and I have noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Well, hello, gardeners. And wannabe gardeners. And people who hate Japanese beetles. <laughs> which I think is probably everybody. Everybody. Yeah. And welcome back, Karen. Aw, oh, thanks so much for having me again, Christy. I'm we're, so happy to be here. And we're glad you're here. It is the most gorgeous Denver day today. It is isn't beautiful. It, it I, is beautiful. I hope folks are out gardening as we are chatting about our gardens and about Japanese beetles today. I hope so, too. Or maybe you're on your way to a nursery. And you're listening pick, in your car. And, and to pick out your beautiful plants yay. that you're going to put into your soil. It's all very exciting. I already went to the nursery this week and bought all my plants. So I'm, ready to, I'm ready to put my veggie garden in tomorrow. We're planning to go tomorrow. We were thinking about, well, and if, if Mitch has time, I'm certain he'll pick some up today. But if not, then we're planning on going tomorrow and getting our hands all nice and dirty. It's going to be nuts at the nursery. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's going to be bananas. Make sure you're armed. <laughs> yes, seriously. Seriously. Come come armed with patience. Yes, exactly. Lots of patience. Uh, well, folks, I hope you're all excited getting ready for composting day, which is May 29th. Which I hope you're doing more than just on that one day. <laughs> sure, that's right. It's Good just point. the day that we celebrate it. <laughs> Good point, Karen. <laughs> and then on May 30th is Water A Flower Day. Just one. <laughs> Just one. Pick your favorite and just water that one. But of course, we don't need to do any watering for a while. Goodness, no. That It's been so rainy. We had like four inches of rain last week. It's been rainy all week. It's supposed to rain today. I know. It's banana pants. So everything in Denver metro area is so green and so green beautiful. And lush. Well, and Mitch was preparing our uh, vegetable garden today. And those weeds were just coming up like nothing. It was like oh, just, yeah, pulling just weeds. nothing. And he got the soil all together. He was like, I don't even think we need any extra soil or any extra compost, anything. It looks so beautiful. Oh, nice. And we saw about 27,000 earthworms. Oh, God. So God. that makes <laughs> me really excited. You know, Karen, I'm always impressed with your counting skills. <laughs> They're very accurate. They are. Yeah. <laughs> Never exaggerated. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's thrilling. And and so how else is your garden going? Do you have anything blooming? You know, and the, I do have a conundrum and um, kind of it's it's hurting a little piece of my heart right now. Our, we transplanted our irises into the front and they're like in a perfect little spot behind our tulips and they're like in a great spot. But this, they're not blooming. We don't have any buds on them. And I think from what I remember, and please, Christy, tell me, we transplanted them. I didn't anticipate that we would receive any blooms or blossoms that following year, mm -hmm. which we didn't, mm -hmm. which was fine. But now I'm like, but wait, where are you? Because shouldn't they be coming up? They should be. But I'll say this is that I think everything is really pokey in the Denver metro area this year. Yeah. Everything is slow. And so I do have some iris blooming now, but I have other sections of my iris beds where I don't see any buds happening. I mean So I I would I would wait. Okay. It's not it's not a, it's not a bad sign yet. It's just yeah. a very weird year. I think the trees are leafing out late. I would agree with that. I would agree with that actually. Like our forsythia was even a little late. Oh, my forsythia died back and did not bloom at all. Oh, Bob. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, That's I thought it was sad. dead. I thought it was dead, but it actually, what had happened is that it just died back. Goodness. To the root ball because we had that cold snap in the spring. Well, that'll do it every time, really. So. It really will. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I mean, what else? What are my options? <laughs> right. You yeah. know? I, I mean, I'll give them a stern talking to but I don't know that that's going to do much. Yeah, you know what? They don't listen very well. Do no, they, they don't. Yeah. They really don't. 
Do you have that kind of iris that have that smell like grape Kool-Aid? No, but I do. I, I remember smelling your irises that smell like grape Kool-Aid. And oh, yeah. I'll give you some. The best time to transplant so iris is July. Okay. So that's good to July, know. I'll dig some up for you. I feel like that's the exact same time that we did it nice when job. we transplanted them. Yeah. It might have been, we might have been a little late. We might have done it in August. Yeah. And it was right not, around there. And you didn't bury them too deep, right? No, 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 no. Right no, on the ground. No, right, on the right, right on the level. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. We did, I think we did okay. everything I right. Would, I would just wait. I don't know. I'm going to talk to him nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, See if sure. I can get I through should. those. I think you should. Well, I do have to tell you that um, I have a lot of stuff blooming in my yard right now. What all have you got? Well, I have lilacs are blooming. Oh, yeah. The lilacs are gorgeous. Some iris. My spirea, that white Ooh. bush is blooming. So pretty. And I have two kinds of poppies. I have California poppies and I have orange um, oriental poppies. Mm. I call them my Georgia O'Keeffe poppies. Yes, because she loved to paint them. Columbine is blooming also in my mm. yard. And the Jupiter's beard is just about to open up. Oh, that's exciting. I it, so I'm very excited. That's but very then exciting. I've also can tell you because it is, you know, near the end of May, yeah. right? I can tell you what has officially died. Okay. So with the blooms comes what's the died. What's well, died? Well, I I have about 12 lavender plants, and about three of them did not come back. Do you know what? What? Just just today, I we looked at our lavender in the front. One of them is doing great, and the other one, I think, is, is gone. I think it's that cold snap. Uh, one. And you know, perennials don't last forever. No, they don't. They, they just, make you believe that they do, but they, <laughs> they don't. Do. And lavenders can be really crabby if, if it gets really cold like that. And so yeah. I lost about three. Um, but I do. I did have some lavender reseed. Do you ever get that? I oh yeah. Know. Oh yeah. So I'm just gonna move some. That's to where I want. So smart. Yeah. Just and they're pretty hardy when you move them, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I also lost quite a few sage bushes. Oh no. So and those um, are hardy too. I'm yeah, shocked. I, know, I had some big ones. I, I had some that got really woody and big. Hmm. And you could just kind of tell like what everything else is doing, and that is just nothing. Absolutely nothing on it. So I'm gonna. Have, but it did also. I have little baby ones. Little baby. Sage bushes, so I'm going to have to dig out the big ones and then just put the baby ones where they were. That's so, the deal, I guess. I think my Russian sage is also dead, but I think that'll make my mail person very happy because it's right <laughs> by the mailbox. And um, in the height of summer when all the bees are around it. Oh, I, gosh, oh, that's got to be like a – that's a, that's a drop and run right there. <laughs> was or so Or you have to move very right. slowly yeah. through – I don't even know what you would do with that situation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe give him a beekeeper's outfit. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> it really isn't. And then I had some Carl Forrester, which is a, a um, or um, ornamental grass, that did not come back. Just not coming back. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I thought it did for a while. And then I realized, oh, no, that's not Carl Forrester. That is just quack grass. Huh. So I thought that some things doing great. Some things die, but that just means more room for different plants. That's I guess. right. It's very true. And I did have my lawn aerated. Do you ever have that done? Yeah, you know, I just go out after a night out on the town with my heels <laughs> and right? just go poke around in my front yard. <laughs> that explains why you're you're. Uh, whenever you, I see you on opening nights, uh, I'm always wondering why your shoes are all muddy. There's, yeah, there's a little <laughs> caked on left. I try and clean them up, but you know, sometimes you can't get it all. Well, I had it done, and um, so it looks like uh, my yard is full of goose poops. Goose poops. Because of all of those plugs that are pulled out, but um, and I do it every year. And usually what I do is I also pay them a little extra to overseed the grass a little bit. That's smart. But one year I watched him do it, Garen, and I realized all he did was he had like a little sandwich bag of grass seed, and all he did was like sprinkle grass on it. And I went, I spent that much extra. How much that. extra was it? You know, it was like another 40 bucks. That's pretty absurd. So That's I, ridiculous. I went and I bought my own grass seed this year. And Fabulous. I sprinkled it myself. I just did it today. And then I was out in the backyard and I realized, oh, I just made a really nice bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> there were birds <laughs> everywhere. They were so happy all, with all you. All these finches were everywhere oh, in the yard. Look at you like, helping oh. out those little finches. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um. I, is, I was going to ask you, um, is your cat Polka Dot doing what our, my cats are doing this week, which is having a hearty diet of Miller Moths? Oh, yeah. 
they turn into kittens like right in front of your eyes all over again it's the sweetest thing and also you know i mean what else what do you expect them to do of course yeah. they're gonna grab them they're gonna snap them and is it bad if they eat a lot of them because i, I don't i hope them not all over the place i really hope not okay. <laughs> I, I think they're really high in protein okay because i read too that they're like major protein sources for birds bats and bears bears yes bears eat anything they do but i kind of got this really cute vision in my head about this bear like you know like the cats do batting and <laughs> batting miller right. moths all over the place and right. then uh, playing with it yeah, and then exactly. letting it go and then letting and then... it go and then once it's really <laughs> dead they well, all right i guess i'll pop it in my mouth <laughs> <laughs> well a I thought it was a real heavy year for Miller moths in our neck of the woods, but apparently it's a normal year. That's what I that's what I read too. The rain that we've been having is prolonging their migration oh, period. Okay. And so they arrived sooner and in bigger quantities because mm. of the rain. There's still more to come. Don't kill them unless you're a cat or a bear or a bird or a bat, because they're so important to our overall ecosystem. Really? They collect a bunch of pollen and they spread that pollen all along their migration. They're pollinators. So they're pollinators. Who oh, knew? No. Oh, that's amazing. So they grab it up and they migrate up to the mountains. They just want to get to the mountains. Mm. They just want to get up to the mountains. Don't we all? Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And the only reason why they're here, like stuck in the city, is because we have all those lights, pretty lights. Oh. So we're actually diverting them from their natural path oh. with all of our city lights. So everybody shut off all your lights and don't eat them unless you're a bird, a bat, or yeah. a cat, or a bear. Yeah. And, you know. And when you're on I-70 up to the mountains, yeah, you can put your lights on and exactly. tempt them up. Exactly. Because <laughs> they want to follow you. That's where they're going. Oh, well, I opened up my garage this morning and it was like... <laughs> It was scary. Mothageddon. It was Mothageddon. Yeah. yeah. There were like 50 miles in there. <laughs> Open them all the doors up. They'll take you down, too. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're going to come back and talk about the bug that everybody loves to hate, which is Japanese beetles. The most beautiful, destructive thing in the whole wide world. Uh, but first, friends, don't forget, if there are words or terms you don't understand, you can check out the funny and informative Upside Down Dictionary at UpsideDownTulips.com, or you can click on the link in our show notes. We also have fun stuff on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And if you like this podcast, you get a laugh or two, a groan at some of the bad jokes, or some good <laughs> tips for your garden, then we hope that you'll consider joining the garden party, which is just uh, throwing a couple bucks our way each month to help support offset the costs of putting on this podcast. And in exchange, you can get some seeds from our garden or some Upside Down Tulips merch like a coffee mug. I love my Upside Down Tulips coffee mug. Oh, that's nice. I use it all the time. And you could also get a, a notebook that has Upside Down Tulips on it to journal your garden. Or we have t-shirts, totes. Totes. St stickers. I don't know. I love a, a tote. <laughs> yes. Who doesn't love a tote? Um, but... First, here comes one of our handcrafted, funny gardening pod plays just for you. A grub is a bug that thinks they're sly, and it's also known as a destructor. Always chomping on all your moss and just eats all through your grass. So, no, I don't want you, bugger, no. I don't want you on my vines, and no, I don't want to see you nowhere, no. I don't want none of your kind, and no, I don't want no grubs. Grub is a bug that won't get no love from me. Hanging in my garden applied, grub gone wide, gonna set my garden free. I don't want no grubs, a grub is a bug that won't get no love from me. Hanging in my garden applied, grub gone wide, gonna set my garden free. Hi friend, it's time to talk about that pretty little bug that everybody hates, Japanese beetles. And, you know, Karen and I, we're not experts. We're just backyard gardeners, and every now and then, it's a good idea to bring in an expert. Don't you think, Karen? Could not agree more, Christy. 
And our favorite expert on Japanese beetles is John Libs, who is the CEO at Phylum Bioproducts, which is a company that's focused on the discovery, development, and sales of non-chemical products for crop protection and animal health sectors and your own backyard. So zooming in with us all the way from the garlic capital of the world, in Gilroy, California. Hey, welcome, John. Welcome back to Upside Down Tulips. Wow, what a nice intro. Thank you. How are you doing uh, today, Christy and Karen? Well, you know, we had so much rain this week, John, that everything in the Denver metro area is green, which is so rare. It's so beautiful, and it's so rare. It's so lovely to see. We need this so badly. And how about you? How is your yard? How is your garden going? Hey, it's looking real, real nice this spring. Like, like you, we uh, we got our share of rain this year. It's, uh, it's it's been nice. We usually cycle through, uh, you know, wet seasons about every eight years, and we get a, a good rains uh, over the winter for a couple of years. And this is our first year having a good amount of rainfall. And uh, boy, the the plants really love it. My uh, my entire yard looks much more healthy than it's looked in about five years. So we're we're pretty happy about all the rain we've received this year. Well, I will also question the rain that we've gotten here in Colorado lately has led to what I would like to refer to as a mothpocalypse, mothageddon. We have so many moths everywhere. And I'm like, is it because of the moisture? I don't know, but it's it's mothageddon. There, there are plenty of insects around where I live. There's... Uh, there's mosquitoes. I haven't seen mosquitoes like this in, in probably five or six years and all sorts of uh, bugs flying around, but it uh, looks like a very healthy ecosystem. And uh, yeah, it's everything's growing really well. And uh, you just, just got to deal with a, a few more insects than usual with all the rain. Well, speaking of a lot of rain and a lot of insects, I'm also a little nervous because I have learned that one of the things that Japanese beetles love is a nice, lush, green lawn, which is what I have right now. They do. They're attracted to water. Uh, we see in drought years, usually the populations uh, ramp down a little bit. Uh, but uh, wet years, they, they tend to grow and they love to lay eggs where there's water and we know where uh, the water is in the yard, where you water your uh, lawn and, and garden. That is true. And John, it seems to me that Japanese beetles have become a problem in Colorado and specifically in the Denver area. Why? Well, I understand that they were transported in uh, maybe seven, eight years ago through uh, some nursery stock. Uh, Virginia creepers in particular seems uh, to have been uh, pointed out as the culprit, uh, there was a golf tournament local and some Japanese beetle, uh, probably the grubs in the soil and in, in the uh, in the potted plants was transported in. And there's really uh, no natural enemies uh, to Japanese beetle in the Colorado area. In fact, uh, that that's uh, fairly uh, accurate across North America. There's not much in the way of insect predators that, that will uh, help uh, control the population of uh, these types of uh, scarab beetles. Of course, there's other animals and birds will, will of course, eat them. But, uh, you know, in, in short, there's just not a lot of uh, predators. So once uh, they take hold and start uh, populating an area, uh, a lot of times folks won't notice them for a while until they have a pretty deep infestation that's really difficult to eradicate thereafter. I have heard that in the Denver metro area, well, especially like this whole front range area, that Japanese beetles run from Pueblo to Fort Collins in our area, and it's considered to be an established, uncontrollable population of Japanese beetles. So they're here to stay. I believe so. It's... It, I, like I mentioned, it's really difficult to eradicate them. Uh, we we have sporadic out, outbreaks of Japanese beetles in California, and the Department of uh, Food and Ag is is really quick to uh, jump on an infestation. You know, we have a lot of agriculture in the valleys here, and Japanese beetle infest and really devastate. Uh, they're, they're voracious foliar feeders, as you 
unfortunately know out there. Uh, they'll they'll take out and you know 300 plus different crops. So the Department of Ag really jumps on it. They trap and look for Japanese beetle uh, outbreaks, and they'll they'll go in very quickly to eradicate with programs. They're doing that cur currently around Sacramento in Northern California uh, this spring and summer again, trying to eradicate a population there. But it's uh, it's pretty tough once they take hold after a couple of years, and it seems to be that's what's happened in Denver. I have a question. What are their natural predators, and can't we get some? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd imagine, uh, you know, it, grubs in the ground. So uh, it, it, wasps will be predators. I know there's a researcher out of Colorado State that's looked at um, different uh, predatory uh, regimens uh, using wasps, and the wasps will go into the ground uh, just like the beetles, but they'll, they'll uh, infect and lay eggs in the larvae of the grubs. But the, the problem with uh, that sort of regimen, and it's been tried uh, many, many different times with invasive uh, species of insects, uh, meaning insects that weren't native to, let's say, the United States and were brought in uh, mainly through commerce in the last 20 years, such as emerald ash borer. Uh, different researchers have tried a lot of different uh, predatory insects, even importing predators uh, from the original locales from where these native invasive, or I'm sorry, invasive species are from, uh, like emerald ash borer, they imported a couple different types of wasps that that are predators of the EAB. But it, it, you just never, it, you just don't see enough control to really knock down the population. It's usually highest uh, level of control you you see is about 15 to 20 percent of the insects will be. Uh, controlled or killed by these predators, but uh, it's just not enough to eradicate. Yeah, that's not enough for me either. I did happen to see this week, I saw this flock of kind of a grackle or a crow land in my backyard and just march all the way through digging into my yard, I'm assuming getting some bugs. And in my fantasy life, they are eating Japanese beetle grubs. That's what I like to imagine that they were doing. Uh, those birds are incredible. I, I've seen them uh, line up on, on the roof line, a gutter, looking down at a, you know, a front yard lawn, <laughs> picking out where they're going to go dig. It's amazing. It, it, and, and yeah, the, the crows are really adept at finding and digging up those, uh, those grubs for sure. But uh, yeah, you know, your, your choice is, uh, use products to try to dampen down the uh, the grub population uh, controls, or uh, let the let the birds dig up the yard. Sure. <laughs> well, how do you know if you have them? And I gotta say this is that I started noticing them in my yard and my garden maybe three four years ago. How about you, Karen? When did you start noticing them? Christy, I think it was about the same. It's about three or four years. And I was like, what are these gorgeous things? And then I was like, oh my god, they're destroying my grapes. There you go, and that, that that's interesting. And, and I've I've learned over the the last four to five years what what may have happened early on in infestations. I I know when when uh, you know Colorado comes out of winter, you know they, you guys have a lot of snow and cold weather, so the lawns don't necessarily look all that healthy in early spring. So if if you have an infestation of grubs, you, you wouldn't necessarily even know it because the entire landscape or lawn is is brown is brown whereas let's say on the east coast where they have a lot of rain all winter and then early spring their lawns look healthy and then the spots where the lawns are not healthy it's very apparent and if you have brown patches within this nice green lawn it, it, chances are you probably have a bug problem in the soil profile and those bugs are probably eating the roots. So I think Denver sort of got behind the curve on understanding what was going on with this new invasive pest because folks didn't really notice it in the lawns where you could where it was localized, didn't move around a whole lot, and you could control it easier. And all of a sudden, you'd see these beetles flying everywhere, and everybody was focused on trying to run around and, and control those, which is more difficult to 
control than the grubs because, of course, they fly around and they move around a lot. So I think that's where Denver really got behind the curve on controlling or even having a shot at eradicating this uh, bug. Well, that makes sense. Um, Well, let's talk about the life cycle. These little critters only live about 10 months. Is that right, John? We'll start in the spring. You have uh, grubs that have overwintered in the ground, meaning they they burrow a little deeper in the soil profile as temperatures drop below, let's say, 55 Fahrenheit, and they overwintered. They just were sort of hibernating down there. And then as the temperatures rise and the soil profile uh, rises to a temperature of 55 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or higher, they start moving their way up towards uh, uh, the roots of the plants, including turf, and then they start feeding. Um, and that, that's when you'll start seeing damage within a few weeks, perhaps uh, even though your lawn's brown, maybe you'll see patches that just peel right up. And that's because these grubs are eating the roots of the turf and there's nothing holding the, you know, these patches of grass in the ground any longer because the roots have been eaten away. So that's one sign. But then these uh, grubs, they'll, they'll continue to feed in uh, through the spring and then they'll go into their part of the life cycle where they'll, where they'll turn into the adult Japanese beetles, which you all are very aware of. And then they'll come out of the ground and start flying around for a few weeks, uh, you know, wreaking havoc, as you know. And then uh, three, four weeks is usually about the peak infestation of the adult beetles. And then they'll decide to burrow back in where there's uh, a good amount of water, uh, you know, a lawn. If uh, it's been well irrigated or, or garden, you're keeping it nice. They're attracted to water, they'll die back in and lay eggs. And then within a couple of weeks, those eggs will hatch out uh, as larvae and start growing through the fall, um, especially if you don't put down any products to try to control those newly hatched larvae. And, you know, uh, mid July or early July through mid August. Um, and those, if, if, you, if they aren't killed, at that time, they'll continue to, to feed on the roots of grass or your other uh, plants in the garden as grubs, and they'll continue to grow, and they'll become quite large, uh, a little over an inch. And then when the soil profile or the temperature starts going down again, they'll die back down uh, and hibernate over the winter and start the cycle all over again. Well, John, is this a good time to get a leg up on those grubs? And if so, why? Yeah, sure. We, we usually explain uh, there's really three windows of opportunity to go after the grubs. There is the spring window, and this is traditionally when most of the chemical products are put down. It's a, it's a bit of uh, an efficiency built into a process where landscapers are out using fertilizers. So they go ahead and, ahead and put down grub controls. Uh, these overwintering grubs tend to be the most difficult to kill because they're very large. Larger pests are more difficult to kill, but all the products work pretty well against the overwintering grubs, including grub Um, Your acelaprim based products work well. Uh, this time. Obviously, the metacloprid products work well at this time. And all the products work pretty well for the next couple of months. Um, and then the second window is really that that timing where I mentioned uh, just a moment ago where the beetle has laid the eggs, the eggs hatch out, and obviously small larvae. And that's a really good time to put down our product to go after those small larvae. It's kind of the midsummer window, we call it, and uh, before those grubs start growing. And so if you hit one of those two windows, you're pretty good. And then the third window is called a curative treatment. Let's say later in the fall, if you see some breakthrough, let's say you didn't put down any product and all of a sudden you see some damage, you can spot treat. Of course, if you put down product, chemicals or our product, and you see some what we call breakthroughs, some damage, you can spot treat. So that's really the three different opportunities you have to control the grubs in the ground. Well, let's chat about uh, 
ways to mitigate, to reduce the level of Japanese beetles. Of course, folks, you're never going to get rid of all of them. And we at Upside Down Tulips kind of feel like, um, you know, the best we can do is reduce um, uh, annoying bugs and insects while still staying organic, while still helping preserve our, our, our beneficial insects and our pollinators. And so there actually are some ways that people will uh, reduce the amount of Japanese beetles. And I guess the first thing is for folks to kind of figure like, you know, well, you could do nothing, right? You could just live with Japanese beetles, right? Um, But I think that it it all depends on how your enjoyment of your yard and your garden. And if you have a couple Japanese beetles, well, that probably is just fine. But if you're getting thousands and thousands and they are skeletalizing your roses and your grapevines, and for me, it's my... um, my Virginia creeper, it's my morning glories that I see it on. It it hurts the enjoyment of my garden. So um, I always do something. Um, the most popular thing that people like to do is to do soap and water. Do you do that, Karen? I do that, yeah. And actually, my daughter kind of enjoys doing it too. She'll go out there with a stick and a big bowl full of soapy water. She'll just grab them, put them in, on in there, you know, as many as she can get. You have to be persistent though, don't you? It's a never-ending process. It's never-ending. It's every single day. Or Edith will go out there three times a day. Wow. Who has time for that? Not us. Oh, and, and I should say the reason why you need soap is interesting because Japanese beetles can swim. Goodness me. So you need the soap to help them drown. Poor little buggers. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, soap and water, that's that's old school. That's, uh, that is that is the way to go. Uh, you know, spending some good time with your daughter out in the yard. Uh, I'm sure that's... Uh, that's fun time uh, teaching her. H- how old's your daughter? She's almost thirteen. Okay, well, that's nice. She wants to spend time with mom outside. Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a good thing. I like that. All right, and she she's learning a little bit of biology at the same time. All right, well that's that's good. Um, yeah, I I know some folks out there that use soap and water. Really, the the main issue with with that sort of process is it's time consuming. So if uh, if you uh, if you're short on time, that that's a tough. Uh, Tough way to control uh, Japanese beetles, uh, not doing anything and letting nature take its course. Uh, that can be difficult down the road. Uh, only, you know, basically these beetles, they'll lay 30 to 40 eggs each and, and likely those will hatch out and become larvae and new beetles that, that'll love to hang around your yard uh, for the next season. So. You, you sort of have to be careful about uh, letting nature take its course. Um, the other, the other, uh, other sort of non-chemical or uh, let's say uh, biological or safer options, such as neem oils or traps. Yeah, they they, they work to varying degrees. Uh, the the traps, and I know uh, again researchers at Colorado State uh, mention uh, different. Uh, research that that they've done or or research articles that that state that uh, if you're using traps they do attract beetles so you just don't want to hang those traps uh, in your garden you'd want to hang them on the outskirts of your property and and try to attract the beetles away from where you don't want them to feed and then the neem oil can be a, a decent option that's not really a a biological or or an actual control in the sense that it doesn't have any biological, uh, let's say, uh, action on the insect. It, it really gums up the mouth parts of the, of the beetle. And therefore, it, you have to be a little bit careful with the neem oil because it'll gum up other insects, whether they're, you know, pollinators such as bees and butterflies or, or other beneficials such as ladybugs. So, uh, and that, you know, every, every product has a little bit of its pros and cons. And of course there's, you know, there's other chemical sprays, but again, you need to be careful with those, whether they're the safer sort of chemicals that have been highly concentrated like permethrin, which was really a natural chemical out of a flower, but it's been highly concentrated and they're broad spectrum, uh, Insecticides, so they'll they'll kill pollinators and other beneficials as well. 
and you know spraying chemicals you, you just you, you need to be more careful Our, ours is very safe for the homeowner and uh, non-targets uh, some of these other products aren't aren't so safe uh, for you to be spraying i've been using grebgon now for a year um i've used it three times i used it last spring last fall and now i'm going to be putting it down this spring in fact my bag of grub got arrived this morning. I ordered it straight from uh, your company, John, from um, Phylum Bioproducts. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell folks this is that, sure, it's a little bit more expensive than if you were to get a broad spectrum pesticide. But I feel better in my yard and in my garden having something that's certified organic that's not going to hurt the bees and the pollinators, but still will manage the uh, grubs. Um, and it's very easy to apply. I put it in my broad, my broad spreader that I push around. And one bag lasted two applications in my yard. And I have a pretty good sized yard, a big front yard and a backyard. And so I was able to cover, cover it twice, once in the fall and once in the spring. And I used to use, before that, I was using that milky spore uh, application, which is a nematode. But the Colorado Extension Office has mixed reports on the um, efficacy of that product. So I switched to GrubGon. And I mean, all I can say is just from my, you know, my own little, you know, I guess I'm just my own little scientist in my backyard. But I felt I had less than my neighbors. So I like the percentages that you were talking about, John. And I'm also curious, seeing that it is a fabulously organic product, which is very important to me, especially when they're talking about your garden and it's next to products that you eat, you know, like on my grape leaves that are adjacent to my beautiful grapes that I still want to be able to enjoy. I do have a question. Is it safe to use? Also, I have two dogs that spend a lot of time outside. Is this safe to use in their proximity? It sure is. Both products are. It, they're, uh, they're very safe products. It's not that you want to feed your dogs the products. You don't want to do that, but it's certainly safe for them to come in contact with the products. Uh, with GrubGun, you still want to target a timing of application where either have sprinklers and it can irrigate it in. I know a lot of folks around Colorado may not have that option, but uh, time it so that there's rainfall within a week or so that you expect, spread it, let the water rain irrigate it in. Uh, but certainly they're, they're very, very safe uh, products, very uh, deeply reviewed by the EPA and also OMRI. And to... Uh, just kind of go back to uh, uh, Chrissy's comments about Milky Spore. And, and by the way, thank you for your return business. Appreciate that, as always. Um, Mil Milky Spore, it, it, it is a, another microbial product. But the big difference between our type of microbial product and that one is uh, the microbe in our product makes a lot of the active ingredient protein. And that's really the key to the success and, and high performance of our products. Uh, there's a lot of protein in there that only affects the target insects. Whereas the milky spore product, that microbe does not make a protein. So you're relying on a buildup of this microbe over two to three years. If you read the label on milky spore, they actually um, detail it out that you, you may have to spread it uh, two to three times per season. You may not see any performance out of it until two to three seasons later. So you're already in it, you know, six to nine, 12 applications before you see much in the way of control. Uh, and, and then, you know, we've done a lot of testing, our products versus the biologicals, non-chemical products, and our products versus the chemicals. And we're always striving to perform at the levels of the chemicals. And traditionally, this sort of technology that our products are based on has competed in ag in controlling other types of bugs at the levels of the chemicals. So we know the technology is really, really good. We just uh, we, we work at it to make the products better and better. And certainly, our product is, is the best combination of performance and safety out there. 
uh, works like the chemicals at, at that high level. We're always looking for close to 85, 90% control, uh, but also as safe as any other uh, non-chemical products out there. Guess what, John? You just got a new customer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I've never used the grub gun before, but I'm going to do it now. All right. Yeah. What was nice, too, is that it was it was free shipping. And so I think all totaled, it came to like $85, Karen. So Nice. Well, I'm, you know, this is what happens when I go to cocktail parties coming up is people say, oh, Christy, hi, how's it going? What's going on? And, you know, you're looking great. And then they say, so seriously, what do I do about Japanese beetles? It is the most common question I get. And it usually starts around 4th of July, I think, is when I saw my first Japanese beetle last year. So, um, uh, you know, to know your enemy, to understand your enemy is the best way to win the war. So that's why we appreciate you being here, John, and telling us all about this very pretty little bug that we all hate. You bet, Chrissy. Yeah. Yes, and thank you so very much for all of your fabulous information as well as all of your fabulous products that I cannot wait to use. I'm a big fan of a preemptive strike, so I'm I'm really looking forward to getting this spread. There you go. Good luck. You know, maybe I could develop a sort of Marvel spinoff movie with a supervillain that is the female Japanese beetle because I think she would be so stunningly gorgeous and horribly, horribly invasive and awful. <laughs> <laughs> be quite a character. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little shop with you again. Uh, you've really helped us uh, get the get the message out there. And as a company, we're always striving uh, to uh, help bring solutions to uh, you know homeowners uh, for their lawn and garden needs. And and we we want to continue to move forward and and make our products better and better for the consumer out there. And uh, I, I think we're getting pretty close to, to uh, you know, producing some really good products for you. And, and uh, hopefully uh, they work well this season for you. Thanks so much, John. From sea to shining sea, in the deep south, on the plains, in the foothills, and in the great northwest, there's a new presence in town. It's the badass backyard gardener. With a trowel on their hip, a hoe under their arm, and a bag of mulch strapped to their saddle, they're ready to plant, weed, and harvest. Come what may, they're ready for anything. Like a badass boss. A freeze, Mother Nature? Isn't it a little early? Never mind. I've got floating row covers, hot rocks, and sheets for tents. I will save my garden. So go ahead. Make my day. Like a quarterback. Okay, everybody, fertilize the 20-yard line and line up defense. Bring out the poop tea dispensers. Omaha. Like a sheriff dispensing frontier justice. I'm sorry, but there's not room enough for two big boys in this tomato town. One of you has to move out. And you, cutworm and slug, you just get out of town. We don't like your kind round here. If you don't go, I've got cardboard toilet paper roll for you, cutworm. And a saucer of old beer for the slug. And at least he'll die happy. Like a maverick. I see you, beetle, eating my nasturtiums. Meet the water bucket, beetle. I'd hang you, but I don't have a rope that's small, and you don't have a neck. Like a life coach. I'm going to mulch ya, water ya, weed ya, and spray those aphids away. Come on, little broccolini. The future is yours. And you, arugula, you got to stay hydrated. You wilty. Here. A lawn chair over you so you get some shade and live a nice, long, healthy life. We see you backyard gardeners, front yard gardeners, farmers, gardeners who use community gardens, gardeners who keep containers on their porch. All respect and love, gardeners. Keep on growing something. Hey, Karen, guess what? What? Guess what time it is? What time? It's mailbag time. Ring, ring. This week... Oh my goodness, friends, this is the best ever. 
we have a letter from our very best friend, Edith. Edith. I love her. I miss her. I I don't get to see her face enough. Well, I still have coffee with her all the time. Oh, well, rub it in. (laughs) Whatever. Well, Karen, tell, (laughs) tell us what Edith has to say. Edith has to say the following. For the first time in a very long time, I did not put my garden in on Mother's Day. Waterlogged soil and cool temps kept the seedlings in their pots. Also, for the first time, I bought a heat lamp and have rotated my plants under it. The seedlings do seem strong and not leggy like Anne Margaret. <laughs> I love that. It's so funny. I did sow seeds. Beets, chard, spinach, lettuces, carrots, and radishes. The radishes are not giving me a lot of love, as usual. But this year, I have become the relentless radish sower. I've sowed radishes at least seven times and everywhere. The first ones went out on St. Patrick's Day, and I have yet to have a full-grown radish. It's like I have Peter Pan radishes. <laughs> so annoying. That is annoying. It is really I know. annoying. Like the, the radish is the forever. easiest thing in the world to grow. Yeah, you would think you would oh, get no, no, of them. no offense, Edith. Yeah, no offense, Edith, at all, or anybody else out there who mm-hmm. can't grow radish eye. <laughs> What's not annoying is that I have marvel of four seasons lettuce that reseeded itself everywhere. With all the rain, salad days came early this year. The overwintered. Spinach and some onions overwintered. Sometimes the onions are rotten, but sometimes they're still good. Also, I had a Swiss chard that whose root I left in, and it has leaves. Unbelievable. Christy, that pun is for you. I guess a spelling pun is not the best for just audio, though. (laughs) What I planted that didn't come up at all? Arugula. No idea why. And parsnips, although it takes them such a long time. And out of two rows of beets, I see two little beets. (laughs) And one that inserted itself under a paver. (laughs) It's doing really well, probably because the heat from the paver. And for heaven's sakes, no cilantro. Not one reseeded itself, and none of the many seeds that I tossed around took hold. No idea why. My new apple tree had blossoms, as did my plum tree, but here's the sad news. My peach tree had none. Last year it was damaged by a peach tree borer, a vicious bug that had what looked like peach jam oozing from the tree. I had my tree service try to save it, and they used insecticides. I think that's why it didn't blossom, although the tree looks healthy now. Because of the insecticide, I was cautioned not to eat anything that grew within a five feet radius of the tree. Mm. Of course, that stuff's nasty. Yeah. And Christy, I do have a question. I notice that everyone is talking about how bad their roses look. Mine look mostly dead. And then I see bright green leaf growing out of a brown branch. How bad would it be to trim the roses a lot right now? Or what is a better idea? Edith. Oh, well, Edith, first I want to say I feel so bad about your peach tree. Oh, that's just miserable. I do it makes want, me want to cry. Yeah, I'm, and I'm going to just hold out that maybe because our spring is so pokey. Yeah, maybe it'll still happen. Maybe it'll still happen. It could. It really could. Yeah. Well, we really don't get good peaches. I mean, when you're talking about like palisade peaches, we right. don't really get those until August. That would be the fruit, though, but you Correct. have to have the blooms. I know before you can get the fruit. Yeah. That's how it works, huh? Yeah. And then also, it's I'm sad for me because when she has a good peach year, I get the benefit of it. Oh, I know. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And it's so sad to me that, like, not only that, but that, you know, they had to use insecticide. Yeah. That makes things awful and sad. Yeah. But her plum tree is is new. And so it's good that she's going to get plums. Oh, that's so so cool. Yeah. That's nice. That's so cool. Well, here's what to say about roses. Is that um, my roses, I have a lot of climb. I have about maybe eight or so climbing roses, and then I have a peace rose. Hmm. And they all died back. Hmm. Um, probably like 75% of them died back. That's so So it's going to be a very pathetic rose year. And I and apparently that just happened in our whole region. It can happen. Like lavender. Right. Like for Cynthia. Right. Um, they... They so it means for me for my climbing roses because they bloom on old wood. It's going to be a very pathetic rose Aww. year this year. But I but my peace rose, which is you know a hybrid rose, that that but that should bloom really quite nicely. So my answer to Edith is huh. cut it back. Yeah, give it a healthy trim. Yep, 
um, that's what I would do. And now's a great time to do it. Yeah. I'd, I agree. And especially because she's seeing some some green. Yeah, green is a good yeah, sign. Yeah, green is always a good sign. So I, I'm totally with you. Give it a nice haircut. See <laughs> see what it grows back. Yeah. And also, if especially if it's a hybrid rose, it might not come back the, same, the, the right color. How interesting. Because most roses are grafted on old rose stock. And so like a yellow rose, if a yellow rose, a hybrid rose dies back it'll come back its original color so it'll come back most likely red that's so cool so i love that so you idea. might have some mystery that's fun it. that's fun that's like those um mystery lollipops you get yes exactly you right know? yes you don't know what you're gonna get till you open it up and put it in your mouth don't put roses in your mouth well you can but don't <laughs> well friends if you have questions comments we want to hear how your garden is doing this year. What are your plans? That sounds fun. We want to know, um, do you have, is your, how's your peach tree doing? How are your roses doing? Um, what are you doing about Japanese beetles? Oh boy, those Japanese beetles. Uh, please write to us at UpsideDownTulips.com or at UpsideDownTulips at Gmail. The rain has cleared. The sun is out. We are getting ready to plant, plant, plant. Do we need any more inspiration? Sure, why not? <laughs> Karen, do you have some inspiration for us? Oh, do I? I actually have two quotes um, that I found to be very inspirational, especially for this time of year. One is by Margaret Atwood. In the spring, at the end of the day, you should smell like dirt. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Love that smell, too. I love that too. so much. So good. This next one is also really good about planting. When we touch the earth, we take refuge in it. We receive its solid and inclusive energy. We receive its stability and fearlessness. <gasps> Thich Nhat Hanh. That's, I just love that. That's gorgeous. Yeah, I love the idea of that transference of energy yeah. that you have with your garden. And also, I love describing the earth as fearless mm. because that's exactly what it is. It's so stable and it's so fearless. It's such, it's such, it's, that one really got me. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Well, friends, you reached the end of another episode of Upside Down Tulips. We are Karen Slack and Christy Montour Larson. And if you got some laughs and some sort of value out of this week's episode, could you please do us a favor? Hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you so very much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you want more, just go to UpsideDownTulips.com or DeniseGentilini.com. And join us in two weeks for another episode that will hopefully delight and absolutely amaze you. And don't forget, Karen, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down.